All right, thank you. Uh, Damien, is our sound okay? Yes. Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, so welcome everybody on my behalf as well. Uh, my name is Jonas Jukkara, and this is my first WordCamp. Uh, any other first timers here? Raise your hand, okay, cool. That's good, I'm not alone. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly uh, talk a little bit about myself. Uh, basically, I am a marketer. Uh, I think we have a lot of uh, very technical people here, a lot of developers. Let, let's just get a little little poll here to kind of figure out what kind of audience we have. So how many of you uh, consider yourself mainly as a, as a developer? Raise your hand. Yeah, I think that's... Vast majority, okay, how many of you consider you mainly as a marketer or digital marketer? Okay, cool. And how many of you uh, consider yourself you're an entrepreneur or, or an um, uh, individual blogger, something like that? Okay, a few hands, okay, cool. So yeah, so I consider myself mainly a marketer. Uh, I have a little bit of a technical background. I used to do uh, websites when, when I was in my teen, uh, teens, basically, uh, because at that time uh, I was playing a lot of Counter Strike and I wasn't very good at it. So I basically had to have some additional skill to get into, into class, and that for me it was uh, doing websites. Uh, currently, I work for a company called Seoseon. Uh, we're mainly doing digital marketing um, for the Nordic market. Before that, I was uh, working uh, a little bit more than two years, two and a half years uh, in China, in Shanghai, uh, running uh, digital marketing operations of a consulting firm called Decentral and Associates. And basically, um, my job there was to handle all of the all of the channels, including the websites. And during my time there, we launched like uh, we had a kind of a ecosystem of websites, and we launched like eight eight websites. And um, currently. Uh, at that time, I was more like an in-house marketer, and now I'm more of a um, working with, with clients and help them with their marketing um, problems. Uh, so basically, that brings me um, into the, to the fact that it doesn't really matter if I'm dealing with a client or if I'm dealing uh, with my boss or, or somebody, you know, the partners of the firm, shareholders. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a confusion for a lot of the top decision makers on what is really the, the value or what is the reason to have a website. And I was kind of like, I've started to thinking about like what would be a good way to uh, present it to them uh, in a good like analogy that lets them uh, kind of figure out that the website is not necessarily just kind of like a business card online. And since it's more uh, much more than a business card online, that means that they should actually put in some resources into that. Uh, here is something that I tend to show for, you know, uh, in, my, in my slide when I'm talking about digital marketing generally for a, let's say, a newcomer into the company or somebody who is, like, not very familiar with it. I, this is, like, my very simple marketing stack. Uh, basically, what it means that everything uh, on the bottom has to be figured out before you can... Uh, do any meaningful things on the, the top level uh, parts of it. And infrastructure means like server side, people, analytics, obviously, figure, we use that to figure out what's actually happening on the website. Content, and then the channels. And the website is actually one of the channels. Other channels could be, you know, um, could be, could be uh, social media channels, they could be email marketing and so forth. Uh, but the thing here is why the website is such an important part is because it basically affects all of these parts of this marketing stack. When you start to develop a website, if you really want it to be a functioning, uh, well-functioning website that is actually helping your business, or if you're a nonprofit organization, whatever your other goal is, you kind of have to think all of these things when you actually start to develop the new website. Okay, so we had um, two problems here. One was the, the things that we have to consider, and the other one was to actually tell the top decision makers uh, why we have to put resources and why we have to actually put a lot of emphasis into the, the website development project. So I was starting to think, yeah, what's the good analogy? Uh, and I was starting to think that, okay, maybe a website 
is pretty much like a mall. Uh, it's like a mall because people come there without actually uh, giving anything back to you at that point. They haven't made a purchase. They don't have to buy a ticket to get in. They just come there because something in that website attracts them. Uh, the other thing, what is very similar with the mall and a website, that you basically should be designing it, considering the visitor, considering the customer, keep the customer uh, in the center of the design process. Because basically what you want it to be is that the customer feels comfortable on the website or on the mall, and they navigate it in a way that supports your, um, the true goal of your website. And the third thing is that oftentimes the basic structure, both in malls and websites, they tend to, say, uh, tend to, to stay the same for a longer period of time. But obviously, in both cases, what we're doing is basically um, figuring out what the people are doing in the, uh, in the mall on the website, and we're fine-tuning the layout, we're fine-tuning the content, uh, and we're fine-tuning the visitor flow accordingly. Okay, so I was thinking, like, if I tell to my boss or if I tell to a client that you're not really, when you're, build, when you're, when you're um, coming up with the new uh, website, you're not actually building a business card, you're not really building a brochure here, you're building a mall. So that kind of puts them into a different type of mindset where, you know, this is more functioning and this is actually, you know, the malls. Generally, when people think about malls, it's kind of, okay, people go there and buy stuff. And when you're talking to a you know, decision maker or, or, or um, non-technical boss of yours, you know, when you're saying that, okay, people are gonna come here and they're gonna give you money, then that gives you a reason to tell them that, okay, that's the reason why you should be putting actually X money on this. This is an actually an investment. Um, oftentimes when people are like, okay, starting to explain, um, uh, sometimes technical people start to explain the reason why, okay, why a cost of a website is this and this and this, uh, it might end up by coming out like, okay, it's because we need to do this and this takes time and this takes hours, okay. So um, I was just thinking that when you're saying that to a decision maker, they, they tend to think that, okay, uh, now you're just telling me the costs. Uh, so now you're talking about money, okay, I understand money, but you're talking about cost because it's a negative thing. Instead, I would rather like to focus on the thing that the, the actual uh, end product can bring you the value. Um, the purchases, hence uh, why I like to call it as a mall. So the next step was for me was then, okay, I was thinking like, okay, if we can say that a website is a mall, uh, let's look at the way that a people who are designing malls, what they are doing, and there, should there be something that we might be able to pick up from their processes and put it into our own um, development process. So, how do I start my research? I start obviously by going to Google and figuring out okay, how to design a mall. Uh, some very um, top things to do, da 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 da, uh, listings, thing content. But then I found this great post from, uh, from uh, this Indian guy uh, on LinkedIn, was how to design a mall inside out. And I started reading it, and he basically starts the post by um, telling some of the, the, the kind of like uh, aspects that he has encountered while designing malls. And I started thinking that, oh, this kind of like sounds similar things that I tend to encounter uh, with some of the websites projects uh, that I've been dealing with. So pretty much every project starts with great enthusiasm and fever, but then if things haven't been, you know, figured out properly at the beginning, they soon turn into a nightmare. And then the problems arise when one designs the space and decides to build without proper understanding and knowledge of the business requirements. Same thing with the websites. You end up getting into problem if you actually just gonna go with your, your designers. You're gonna say that, oh, I kinda like this and this looks good. And then you start focusing on the actual exterior instead of the real essence of that website. What is the real goal? What do we wanna achieve? and how we can actually work everything for that web design in a way that it actually helps us instead of hinders us to, to, um, to achieve that goal. And what obviously 
the people apparently in the mall world well want is that the customer is effortlessly guided through the mall as if in auto mode. And I think this is pretty much the same thing as web developers and marketers who are using this website to, to bring in sales, to bring in leads. Uh, this is basically what we want. We want it to be in a way that when people enter, they're kind of like in an auto mode, uh, consuming the content and then ending up into the end goal that we want them to do. So it seems like you know, there's a lot of similarities in the way that he thinks uh, malls should be designed and the way that I think that, OK, we should approach website design. Uh, so then he gives us a little bit of an example on how they tend to design malls. Uh, he broke it down into four steps. Uh, we're going to be looking at what would these steps mean in the wall, mall world and what, in my opinion, they mean in a web design world. So we'll start with the right advice. Basically, um, he was saying that before you start a mall project, you should go and find a shopping mall specialist. And this tends to be a person uh, who has experience on running a mall operations and running the leasing of the mall space, as well as architects. And obviously, in a website world, this would then mean that you would want to seek out into a professional who not only understands necessarily the, the technology, but there's also somebody who understands your business and the operations. Or if you're very self-sufficient and you want to do it everything uh, in-house, make sure that all the stakeholders who are affected by this website, which is probably at least, you know, the designers and developers, but also marketers and your salespeople, that they get together in the beginning to figure out you know, what are their needs. And then the person who takes the lead uh, is actually you know, putting these everything together and kind of like lets everybody sign off on the, on, the, uh, on the original design and original idea. So the original idea, the concept. Uh, after you get everybody together, you get the right advice. You kind of have to figure out uh, what's your concept. So now we're talking about what's the, what's the thing that you actually want to do. Uh, in the mall world, they base this on usually on market research, uh, customer uh, expectations, demographics, locations, whether the mall is, you know, is, is in a smaller neighborhood mall or will it be you know, uh, a big kind of a whole uh, city level attraction. And um, they gather this information, and then they make it into a concept. And one of the important things is then to go to all of these stakeholders who are, with the, who are handling the design process and communicate the concept to them. Uh, website world, basically, we want to figure out pretty much the same thing. Who are we serving? Who is the visitor? Who is the customer that we want to actually get into the website, that we actually want um, to go through the whole process of purchasing or you know, the whole process of, um, of signing up. And what do we want them to do? And then again, communicate the concept clearly so that everybody who's involved in the process should understand what we're aiming to do. All right, and then you chose the right advisor and the next step is kind of like choose the right architect. And in the mall world, they're looking for architects who have the in-depth understanding of retail architecture and local market trends and shopping habits. So it seems like in the mall world, you're not just going to pick the person who has designed a mall, but you're actually going to go and try to find a person who has uh, designed the mall and has worked in the same kind of a market with the same kind of a demography, uh, people with the same kind of shopping habits. So this would translate into website world that you don't just want the developers to be um, people who understand technology, but they have to understand the business. And in the best case scenario, you would find somebody who also pretty much understands your industry. That means that uh, best case scenario, if you're a B2B consulting firm, you would find somebody to work with uh, that has previously been successful in doing websites for B2B companies. Same way, if you're an e-commerce uh, store, let's say you're specialized on clothing, you probably would want to work with a web developer 
designers who have previously had success on actually uh, executing e-commerce stores close. So basically, the, 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 the closer you get into having a team um, who understands the business, the technology, and most importantly, the way your customer thinks, the kind of a better result you will have. OK, you got your team together. You have the right advisor. You have the concept. Uh, it's time to uh, come up with uh, the actual brief. So the brief is then something that will be given to the team so they can start executing uh, this design. In more world, uh, the brief is uh, split into, into a few different categories. Uh, it starts with an inter introduction. And basically, in the introduction, they want to communicate to you the bigger picture. Uh, basically, this should tell where this mall will be, what's the location of it, what's the target consumer, and what, and basically not just telling your developers or designers and the rest of the team these things, but also give them uh, the reasons why you think this is true and the data sources, why, how you came up with this idea. Um, the same thing basically uh, translates pretty well into website world. So you get the company's background, you know, uh, if this website is something uh, a part of their bigger scheme, is it part of a multiple website? You know how people tend to tend to uh, communicate with their brand. Uh, what's their presence on social media, and how these things actually? What, what's their current basically? What's their current situation with all of the different channels? Because generally, um, the visitor is not just communicating with one channel. They're going to be, you know, exposed to the to the company, to the brand, to the organization through multiple channels. And when you're starting to develop a new website for them, it would obviously be good to know um, the larger picture of it. Also, it would be probably good to know the kind of a future plans of that of that company uh, or the organization. Where do they think they will be going in five years? Is there some big branding reconstructing going on uh, that would be helpful? to actually figure it out when you, when you start to uh, put the website together. Obviously, target audience, once again, who are we trying to, to um, reach out? And then considerations and data sources. Uh, why this is important is um, let's consider a case where you have a client, you have a project, and somebody's going to tell you that, OK, this is, our, you know, this is what we want to do. This is our target audience. And you're going like, OK, I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to target this audience. Uh, we're going to build it in a way that 27-year-old, um, uh, let's say, Warcraft player would be enjoying his time on this site and would be you know, uh, going through and, let's say, buying a, a, a certain Warcraft-related product. Well. If this is the information you've been given, and then you work according to it, you get your finished you know, website launched, da da da, and after a while, they're saying, like, this is not working. This is like the people, people don't understand our concept. The vis actual visitors don't understand the concept. They don't understand why they're here. They don't understand what they should be doing. And then you go back and, but this was, and tell them that, OK, but this was the people that we were targeting. And you go back and forth, and finally you realize that the people who are now actually coming to the, the website are not the kind of people who the company or the organization originally told you that they're targeting. This is the reason why I tend to also want to have some kind of reasoning from the, from the organization, from the company, why they are choosing a certain target audience, and also if there's any data to back it up. Uh, it's kind of a good place for um, developer team to actually challenge the, the, the client uh, the company a bit to actually dig deeper and make them think what are they actually um, trying to achieve with the website. Some organizations, this is you know clear, they have a good considerations, they have good data to back their decision making, and they're just going to give you the brief. Uh, but a lot of the cases when somebody is going to go through like a big change, like a new website. Um, or revamping a website, it's also a good spot to actually think what is the, 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 the core audience and go into very like a, like a, a deep understanding and doing more research on the, um, on the actual uh, core target audience that the, the organization wants to, wants to reach. Well, 
when you got the introduction in the mobile world, the next step is to uh, have like a project vision. In the mobile world, this means what is the intent of the project? Uh, again, getting more in depth on the actual concept and context. So if it's a larger development center of a neighborhood or something else. In the website world, this translates pretty well. Uh, once again, we can talk what's the real intent of the project and go into very uh, in-depth structuring on what are the other channels that the people who will be uh, interacting with the website, what are the other channels that they're using as well. Then the next phase would be project positioning. In the mobile world, uh, this would be the very specifics of that target customer and the very specifics of that concept. And basically, we can translate the same back into website world. So in the section where we're talking about project positioning, this should give you a very, very precise um, view on who is the target, what's the, what's the persona of the target, uh, hopefully into a level that it narrows down into an age group, into a, you know, what kind of interest they have, and into specific, um, specific job titles they have, and specific, you know, maybe some groups they're communicating with uh, in different, different channels. So very specific. And then after that, we get into the actual aesthetic brief. Uh, mall world, this means the kind of like the design language. Are we talking about high-end malls? Are we talking about low-end malls? Is this the design? Should it be traditional? Should it be contemporary? Uh, basically, what would be the kind of aesthetics that would attract the people that we've been now in the previous, previous brief that we've been, uh, that we've targeted? And this should be based on more world, on market research. And it has to go into the level of details of the materials, what kind of textures we're going to be using, um, what, kind of a, what kind of wood we're using, what kind of a plastic we're using. In the website world, this basically translates into the possible brand guidelines, uh, what kind of colors, typefaces, logos, etc. we're going to be using, what's the framework we're working in. And um, again, this also should be based, hopefully, on some kind of legitimate research. Market research, surveys, even better using the actual user data, using any previous tests that they've, they might have done, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and this, if this is currently lacking, like the, the company hasn't been, it's a new company, or they basically have just been working 40 years, but they haven't actually tracked any of this, which seems to happen quite a lot as well. Uh, then, basically what your job is to make some kind of assumptions and create the website in a way that in the future you can actually test these things. So you kind of give them then the keys to actually figure this out. So when they're going to be doing a next kind of a revamp somewhere you know, down the line, two years, three years, they have a lot of previous research data on the users they had on the website that they can actually utilize. And then, nowadays, mobile first, mobile only. Uh, basically, it's recommended to just think about the mobile user first and then the desktop users. Um, yeah. And then after that, uh, there would be the planning brief. And the planning brief uh, pretty much thinks on the mobile world. It thinks about the entry points. So obviously, you have a building, so there's only certain places in the building where people are supposed to enter. And in the planning brief, you're kind of figuring out what are those entry points. Also, in the mobile world, it requires operational requirements, and this means, you know, uh, does every store in the mall need to have some kind of a backroom space? Do they need to have a backdoor uh, entrance for all the stores, maybe just for the sum of the stores? and different zones in the, in the mall are accessed in a different way. And then accessibility, uh, obviously in mall world, it means you know, that people who have restrictions are able to also navigate through the mall. And then in the website world, we can actually pretty much talk about the same things. Uh, only the kind of like the entry points are a little bit different uh, than in the mall. Oh, okay. Um, so entry points, we're talking about landing pages, uh, and then you have to check out where, where the people are coming to your website. 
uh, operational requirements, who is using the backend, uh, what kind of a technical competency they need, uh, is the, the website uh, easily crawlable and indexable and accessible. Um, so landing pages, you figure out from the previous data what are the, the most um, high traffic landing pages. Infrastructure requirements, um, basically, mobile park and needs requirement, AC electrical lightning and requirements for certification, and website world, what's the current budget for hardware, sequire requirements, what's the expected traffic, you have to think about the future as well, and integration with different platforms. Uh, also understanding the business concept. In the mall world, it means the zoning, and how those, uh, uh, the zoning and the, the way you're leasing it um, changes the way you design it. On the website, uh, obviously, you have to think about the business concept and what kind of content will be displayed. Obviously, the big difference for websites and, and malls is the location. Uh, mall, it's fixed. On the website, the location depends basically on your marketing. So, for example, if we have a person here you're trying to target, uh, for certain persons, for certain numbers of the times, basically your website mall is near him now and he's going to go there, but the next day it might be here, and then after that it might be here. So the situation uh, is not as static as a mall well, but pretty much um, in the uh, other situations, uh, it's sim very similar to mall. But the problem is if you have a poor search visibility, it will be killing your website because your location is not near the person who you want there to visit to your, to your website. Uh, I have a list of technical uh, SEO things to go through. It's a checklist. I think all of the, the slides will be uh, downloadable afterwards. So I don't gonna, I'm not going to go through this uh, very much in depth. Um, one thing I want to point out, though, is that uh, you are giving the, the you might be giving the, the customer a website that is uh, very optimized in speed, uh, but then if you haven't give them a good process and good training, uh, it might be that the customer when they start actually using your platform, they start actually producing content, they might be actually um, they might be actually destroying that optimization. Uh, we had one client that started in a situation like this. Uh, basically, the only reason was that they dumped into a huge HD image that then was scaled uh, in the website into like 300 pixels, but the real uh, original image was like 4,000 uh, pixels. And basically, just changing that image size into a proper size gets us into uh, this situation. Um, also, the way that you uh, design your website affects the way uh, it can be marketed. Um, one page structure, I'm not a big fan, uh, mostly because it's super hard to, to actually share different, um, different sections of that in social media. Um, new sites and blogs, uh, the way that you structure your, you, uh, choose to structure your URL uh, matters a bit. Uh, usually keep it simple, um, it makes it easier. E-commerce consideration. Again, uh, you probably don't want to have all of your variations, for example, a product to be uh, a different product. Why? Uh, one of the, the main reasons is that basically um, you don't have a pretty good control on the search results you have for it because you might end up with a lot of duplicate content, which means that Google is going to omit uh, tons of your products. And when people are searching for something related to your product, they might see a kind of like a different product uh, version since you didn't make them, since you um, didn't make them uh, as variable products, but instead uh, multiple products. Quickly going through, what do you want to measure on a website is conversions. Uh, generally, all of the other things are um, something to, to be taken as a side note, but in the end, conversions, whether it's sales, whether it's leads, whether it's uh, people uh, joining your nonprofit organizations, this is what you want to track. So, uh, I want to end this um, with a little of comparison. Since um, I'm thinking that a website is a good comparison to a mall, let's look a little bit about, let's look quickly about the kind of a traffic that malls, the largest shopping malls in Finland, what kind of traffic they are getting uh, in a month. Uh, Kampi, a bit more than 3 million visitors. Sello, 1.9 million visitors. Itakeskus, uh, it is 1.6 million, and Forum, 1.1 million. And then let's take, here is an e-commerce example. 
large e-commerce stores in Finland. And you can see they pretty much get the same traffic per month as a, as a regular uh, brick and mortar mall. And then you start thinking, how much money went into actually building that mall? How much money does it make, does it take to build a very extremely good functioning website? So yeah, I wanna, I wanna leave you with that. Uh, developers, think about it. If you would get the same kind of budget as a, let's say, Itakeskus or Cello or the, the, the renewed company has, what kind of website could you make out of that? All right, I think I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. I think that was a great, great first talk for our WordCamp and really interesting stuff like I was kind of protecting beforehand. So now it's time for audio questions. Do you have any questions from the downstairs or upstairs? We have two mics, so just raise your hands if you have questions. We have one over here. Um, do you have any favorite specific mall in the physical world that you're thinking about while designing websites? Uh, favorite mall, um, I'd say, well, here, this is actually an interesting question because I was about to say Sello, uh, it's in Leppavara, but the reason probably is that because it's the most familiar to me, right? So uh, this is the kind of the same thing that if you don't, if you're just asking one person uh, about the specific of a design, you might end up with the design that is not actually uh, serving the, the, the whole group. Uh, so yeah, I would be saying sell up, but it's probably because I've been you know, accustomed to that. So the same thing goes with the web design. Uh, everybody has opinions, hence I would say it would be so much better if you have a behavioral data to back up the design plans instead of going and asking your whatever marketing brand manager, asking like, yeah, this looks good, because it might not look good to another person. Any other questions? Hello, good morning. I'll just comment this rhetorical question you have here on the screen. What would happen if we could develop a website with a budget of a mall? What would happen is that the project would go to Tieto and it would fail miserably. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> I didn't hear any question, but that's okay. Uh, actually, I have one question in this middle, if you don't mind. Uh, you were saying that you were in Shanghai like a couple yeah. of years. Uh, how would you compare the mall and the website world in there and in Finland? Uh, okay, this is an interesting point. Uh, basically, the um, the websites I was dealing with was to target the uh, the Western audience, right? So it's those were all much more similar as as the ones that we have, you know, in Finland, as we have in the Germany, as we have in the U.S. Uh, but generally, the situation in China is that um, your own website is not nearly as valuable channel as it is in the Western world. A uh, couple of reasons for that. One is that Baidu being censored and being very uh, protective of its own ecosystem means that it's very hard to actually get into companies' website by search. And so basically it means like, you know, if we, get, if we go back to the, to the location thing, it means that here, uh, where's, the, where's the picture? It means that basically you would be standing here and there might be a very, very nice uh, website or a mall here uh, that's serving your purposes. But then we have a um, Baidu being not very open uh, with anyone who is not spending advertising money. It means that there might be some completely irrelevant mall that, for example, you go and go look there for Nike 
uh, running shoes, but this mall doesn't serve you Nike running shoes. But anyways, it's going to be there right next to you, and you kind of can't even go around it to to the to the mall that you want. So uh, websites there uh, basically are a lot. Uh, if you're targeting Chinese audience, the website is not uh, as important. Uh, obviously, you should probably have one for for even for just branding purposes, and you can also you know use it to to do sales. But uh, e-commerce mostly there happens to the big e-commerce platforms, Taobao, JD. Um, because people tend to trust them. Uh, there's also a lot of like problems with like trust, especially uh, towards a company or even even a big brand, because nobody is you know uh, willing to take the risk that the brand is counterfeit. So it's uh, it's very different. In the mall, uh, malls are more similar, <laughs> except that there tends to be tends to be quite uh, big ones there. Um, but the, in, the, in the mall design, I feel it's it's obviously much more dis um, similar since the people who are visiting malls are. Uh, the behavior is similar, and you know the you go into a mall, and the, the location ecosystem doesn't really affect so much. But websites websites are a, a different different type of ballgame.